This Week in Science and Education is presented in association with the Science Coordinators and Consultants Association of Ontario. Visit their website at sccao.ca. This Week in Science and Education is brought to you in part by the University of Western Ontario, www.uwo.ca. We thank them for their support. This Week in Science and Education is also brought to you by Laurentian University. Check out Laurentian at laurentian.ca. We thank them for their support. Welcome everyone to This Week in Science and Education, episode 78. Uh, we're here with Sue Ree and uh, she's going to tell us all about plants. But first I'd like to introduce our co-hosts. We have Colin Jago. Hello, hello. And Thomas Merritt. Hey. Perfect. So, Sue, why don't you take us away? Tell us about plants. Oh, plants are great. They're responsible <laughs> for... I love plants. They're responsible for the air we breathe, the clothes we wear, and also the food we eat, um, also the cars we drive, you know, gas <laughs> and fossil fuel come from plants. So, they're cool. So, Sue, you and I met last fall, I think. What, when was the, the when we were at the meeting in, in California? And I'm I'm blanking on the month, but so October November it was a metabolomics meeting. Um, I do fly metabolomics. You do plant metabolomics. Maybe give us a a tenth grade twelfth grade uh, definition of what metabolomics is hmm. and why the stuff that you do works so well in the model systems that you work with. Well, metabolomics. Before talking about metabolomics, I should probably explain what metabolism is. Um, you know, the food we eat and the energy that we make that allow us to do what we want to do, you know, go sailing or um, go to school. Maybe that's not something we want to do, but uh, metabolism is essential for um, organisms to live. And metabolomics is the study that um, tries to identify all of the compounds, all of the metabolites in an organism all at once. Something that's sort of been developing in the last 10 years or so. And now the technologies have gotten to a point where we are able to identify thousands of compounds from any organism we want. And I'm interested in studying plants because of all the cool things I already told you about. And uh, we're trying to understand how plants metabolize compounds that are important and useful for humans. So you, you don't just work on, on any plants. There are plants in particular oh, yeah. that you're that your lab focuses on. So why those plants, uh, and then maybe we'll come back to the idea of what, what metabolomics is giving us versus you know a more traditional view of metabolism. So why the plants that you're working on? So uh, we started working on this model plant called Arabidopsis thaliana, which is a little weed, and I have, I have a little pot of Arabidopsis. Awesome. Can you see? They're, okay, this way. They're tiny. So you can mm -hmm. see, you know, this is actually a mature plant. Um, that has these little flowers. I don't know if you can see. Um, yeah, absolutely. This is a model organism. This is the fruit fly of plants because they're small, as you have seen already, and they grow really fast. You can go from seed to seed in about six weeks. And um, you know, lots of researchers in the world are working on it. Um, this small plant, there are over eight or nine thousand labs working on this one organism. And we can do so much with it these days that, you know, we can pretty much engineer this plant. And we hope that all the findings that come out of this plant could be useful for more uh, economically important plants like, like corn or soybean or rice. So then I have a question about that specific plant then, Sue. It, it, do you use it and is it used so, so frequently by scientists? Like you, you mentioned going seed to seed in six weeks because it's easy to work with, uh, like in terms of, of, of growing it quickly and having a quick life cycle, but is it also then generalizable? Like you mentioned, you hope it has application in things like crops and that sort of thing. But is what you learn from that plant generalizable to a lot of other things? Yeah, in fact, um, you know, if you think about the evolution of organisms and in the plant lineage, um, Arabidopsis belongs to a family of plants called flowering plants because they make flowers. Um, there are over 250,000 species of flowering plants today, and they all evolved around 200 million years ago, which may sound really long time, but in the big picture of evolution, we started about five or six billion years ago, 200 million years is nothing. So what that means is that all of the flowering plant, plants that include all of the crop plants 
are very, very close together. In fact, you know, over 70% of the genes are probably doing the same function in all these plants. Okay. So most of what we're going to learn from this model organism is going to actually apply to crop plants. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a really good point. All right, so I mean, and we've talked a little bit about model species before because I, I work on fruit flies, which is obviously you know a model species. Um, although in, in some ways, Arabidopsis, because you've got the ties directly to to crop species, um, there are a lot of questions that you can ask in, in Arabidopsis that we don't have an opportunity to, to ask in in flies. Although, as I say that, you know there has been some interesting work crossing over from flies into things like mosquitoes um, because of disease vectors with with mosquitoes. Colin, help me out here. I, I'm, I'm still out of breath from running down the hallway with That's my okay. PCR That's primers. Okay. I, I want to go back to the to the, the metabolism and sort of getting into the research. And so, can you, can you maybe give me paint me a little bit more of a picture of, of how you study metabolism and the, some of the specific pieces that you're looking at and what you hope to gain and glean from the research around plant metabolism that can be used for other things. Sure. So um, the thing that we're trying to do right now with plant metabolism is. Um, trying to identify the functions of all of these enzymes that make uh, compounds or metabolites in uh, Arabidopsis. Um, I should say that most organisms that we study, including the model organisms, most of the genes, we don't know what they do. So, you know, people started sequencing genomes of organisms maybe 10, 15 years ago um, and identified tens of thousands of genes in each organism, but I would say you know, maybe 15, 20 percent of these genes have been characterized well, and we know what they do and how they do it. And so, what we're interested in the most is to understand or discover um, enzymes that have not been characterized before. And the things that we're most interested in are enzymes that make um, what's called secondary metabolites, which are the kinds of compounds that plants use to defend against pathogens. But in fact, human over the last 10,000 years or so have used probably longer have used uh, these secondary metabolites from plants um, to cure diseases, to feel better. So things like coffee is considered a secondary metabolite, caffeine, yeah, so, um, aspirin um, comes from right. plants as a secondary metabolite, um, lots of THC. anti-cancer drugs. THC, exactly. Yeah, Just throwing that out there. Coffee, yeah, coffees, which are very uh, popular uh, ornamental plants in plants. <laughs> um, oh no, no, sorry. THC is uh, the compound that comes from, yeah, uh, marijuana plants. That's different. Wait, wait, wait um, to be super hip there, Sue. Nice, nice. Super, super hip on that one. They're, they're both popular in Canada, I believe. <laughs> Top hits with the teenagers. That's what we just got here. <laughs> here. So, and why? So to steer this up. All the stuff from Uncle. I'm going to steer back to medicinal uses. Can you give us an example of a medicinal use of your research? Oh, um, let's see. One example of a, a very important secondary metabolite from plants that's used uh, to cure or to try to cure cancer is called Prexol. Yeah. This comes from uh, yew trees and, um, you know, from a whole, like, tree that's been grown for over, I don't know, 200 years or so, you can really get very small amount of this yeah. compound, maybe grams. And um, so what we're trying to do is see if we can actually try to have, make plants synthesize this for us, like in organisms like Arabidopsis. Mm -hmm. So trying to engineer um, pathways that will allow us to um, have plants make these useful compounds is what we're trying to study. And, and that, that is incredibly important. When Taxol was first, or when, when the, the cancer-fighting properties of Taxol were first discovered, I was a graduate student in, in Oregon, and the yew tree grows in Oregon, and it, it's not a very common tree to begin with. And there was a real concern that we were going to take a species that, that was itself threatened and possibly drive the thing extinct because of the, these cancer-fighting properties. And so you've got this trade-off behind or between uh, this great potential in, in the drug applications and the realities of trying to produce that um, in the wild. One of the things, just before we lose, lose it, um, so you talked about the number of genes, the number of genes that we know the function for and, and the vast majority that we don't. You know, we only sequenced the, or it seems like we sequenced the human genome a while ago, but it really has only been since, what, 2000, 2001, something like that. Before that, we had an incredibly terrible estimate of even the number of genes that were present. Right, we overestimated the number of genes in the human genome by almost a factor of four. 
the, there were conservative estimates that between 80 and, and 100,000 genes in the human genome, and we now think there are about 25,000. So, you know, we, we've done a, we're doing better jobs now that we're sequencing, sequencing things of knowing at least what the genes are, how many genes are, where the genes are, but what they do is still this huge black box. And having something like Arabidopsis and having the experimental tools that you have in Arabidopsis uh, allows us to get at those kind of questions. And, and you, you mentioned the number before, and I've already lost it. What are the, the percentage of genes that are shared between Arabidopsis and, and crop species? It's about 70% are very, very similar. They have yeah. over like you know 80% identity in the amino acids um, that make up the proteins. Uh, so we, th we think that the conservation of function and pathways will be very, very high. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and we make that stretch between Drosophila, fruit flies, and, and humans. Mm -hmm. There's something like 80% of the genes that have been implicated in cancer in humans can be studied in flies. And, and that's a much larger evolutionary jump and, and conceptual jump between a fruit fly and a human being, let alone a rabidopsis and a, and a crop species. Mm -hmm. It's a really good point. Excellent. So we, we, quick break to get a word from our sponsors. We'll be back in just a minute. This Week in Science and Education is brought to you by Sheridan Institute of Technology and Advanced Learning at Sheridan Student Shine Writer. Check out sheridanc.on.ca. Thanks for joining us. We're back with Sue Reed. She's telling us all about plants and the role that they have in our everyday lives. So um, maybe we could talk a bit to Colin. Uh, Colin, do you have any questions for Sue sort of from a high school perspective as to how this could apply to their curriculum? Well, it's very interesting because you know, in, in a lot of sort of standard biology classes, you start with plants and you start with, you know, the function of plants and, and, and looking at the different parts of plants and all that stuff. But I'm not 100% sure that we ever get into the metabolism part of plants. Whenever we study metabolism, we very often look at animals. We look at humans and look at, you know, the, the cycles that go on in us. Um, so maybe help me make some connections then between kind of what we standard you know, the standard high school curriculum of studying, say, cycles in, in human and digestion and things like that, and how that can relate to what goes on in plants. Is there some, some connections we could make for kids? Yes, I think so. So as I said in the beginning, the air that we breathe, oxygen, uh, comes from plants. It comes from a process called photosynthesis, sure. which is um, the way in which plants make food for themselves. Plants are amazing in the, in the sense that they only need carbon dioxide, light, and water, and a few minerals to make their own food. And in fact, the food that we eat, either directly from eating plants, plant material, or eating meat, you know, from animals that eat plants, sure. Um, sure. plants are the primary, uh, you know, um, what's called primary uh, producers of the earth. Mm -hmm. So, and they do this by this really cool process called photosynthesis, which captures light and uses it as energy to fix carbon dioxide, get, get the carbon from the carbon dioxide and put it into uh, an organic compound and make sugar, which becomes proteins or becomes mm -hmm. um, lipids, fatty acids, or um, even uh, nucleotides. And um, they also, in the process, can split water into oxygen and hydrogen which physicists have never been able to replicate. This is an incredible, amazing, incredibly uh, amazing machinery that plants know how to do, and nobody's figured out how to do it synthetically. Yeah. Right. So I guess maybe that's one. Uh, the For other the same thing energy. Is there's, the same energy. Sorry? For the same energy amount. It takes us way more energy than it takes the plants. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And um, another really cool thing about photosynthesis is that plants have evolved to do it in different ways. And so under very uh, low carbon dioxide or, you know, drought conditions, um, plants, uh, some plants have evolved to do this thing called C4 photosynthesis, which is kind of amazing. It's actually um, something that allows plants, well, plants have figured out a way of concentrating carbon dioxide in their leaves. And so they've differentiated different cell types um, so that one cell can do the light capturing and um, fix, carbon uh, fix carbon dioxide into sugars. But another cell type can actually take carbon dioxide and convert it into another molecule that, that the other cell can use. And the C4 photosynthesis um, is responsible for about 25% of the uh, oxygen that's produced in, on, uh, in the world, although 
C4 plants only make up about 3% of all uh, land plants. So a lot of researchers, uh, including myself, are trying to figure out how plants do C4 photosynthesis. And in fact, corn does C4 photosynthesis, but rice doesn't. And so people, some people are trying to put C4 photosynthesis um, into rice. Well, one of the things that amazed me when I started working in metabolomics um, was how much we trying to translate between a textbook pathway or, or process uh, and, and the real world is still somewhat tenuous. And so we think that this pathway exists or, you know, you look at a textbook and you can follow from this substrate through this enzyme and across that. But actually the, the real evidence that it happens in organisms is been, has been surprisingly hard to generate. Uh, and a lot of the really interesting metabolomics work, at least in the early 2000s, maybe mid-2000s, uh, was just trying to demonstrate that these, these pathways that we can create in the lab and we project are happening in the organism actually do happen, right? And we're still, you know, you talk about how you translate from the textbook into to the real world. There's a lot of stuff in textbook metabolism that is still largely conjecture. Uh, it works in the lab, and whether it works in the organism or whether it works in all organisms uh, is still a question. And, and, you know, Sue's example of the C4 photosynthesis, there's a lot more diversity in metabolic pathways than I think we appreciated 10 years ago, and certainly a lot more than that than's in the um, textbooks. Uh, there's just there's a lot of variety out there that, that we don't appreciate yet. Okay, well that then sort of follows up then with a follow-up question. I mean, and, and you know, we study photosynthesis and, and we talk about some of those pathways, but then what you just said, Thomas, is, is the mystery and the big mystery is, is how do we get to some of those other compounds? Like you mentioned taxol, for example, in the yew trees. And plants don't just produce these simple sugars and you know cellulose and, and grow. They produce all these other things. So is that where the big mystery is in how all of these other compounds get produced through the, the, the metabolism pathways that we don't understand? Yeah, that's a huge mystery. Secondary metabolism is a big black box. Um, the, I think that people estimate, although you know, I couldn't really find the original source of this estimation, it's sort of referred to uh, by many articles in their introduction, but you know, it's probably um, maybe an urban legend, but people say that there are over um, 100,000 or 200,000 secondary metabolites that are produced by plants. Um, some of it comes from people like um, ethnobotanists who, botanists who uh, go out into the Amazon and different parts of the world to um, isolate different compounds from plants. Sure. Um, but nobody really knows how these products are made in, in plants. And in fact, that's really what we're interested in trying to study. In and and in, in addition to that, one of the things that I do in my lab is just trying to figure out how the pathway, the, the pathways inter interconnect into networks and how the networks interact. And you know you can draw this on a chalkboard. I can't because I'm a terrible drawer, but in theory you can draw this on a chalkboard, but actually showing that these connections exist and that they function in the way that you would expect them to function it has proven to be incredibly difficult. Um, so I mean, one of the things we do is we, we, we study a really simple network and it should just be dead easy to say, if you change here, here has to go up and here has to go down, you know, whatever the, the interaction is. And we almost never get it to do what it's supposed to do. Uh, and, you know, we hit it with, we hit it with a, uh, a stress, and we desiccate it, or we, we um, starve the fly or something, and we expect to see all these things move in this way, and, and they never do. Uh, and we can repeat it, right? So the, the, the interactions are there, but they're not in the direction that we expected them to be, uh, because we just don't understand the models yet. So, you know, there, we've got so many different pieces that we're trying to put together. Yeah, I think this is really uh, an interesting point because, you know, there were lots of activities of this sort of um, theoretical aspect of the complexity of metabolism and how it may all work. And lots of really smart people uh, in, you know, in last century, uh, before really the um, revolution of molecular biology took over, there were lots of activities of these type of theoretical biology sort of um, approaches. Um, Henry Keckscher is, is one person who really started the idea of the um, studying uh, metabolism as a complex system, and you know he started a field called um, metabolic control analysis, 
Um, but it's still today, like, we don't have an empirical way of actually testing the theories that he and others have come up with hmm. almost, um, you know, 60, 70 years ago. But they were really beautiful sort of um, fruits of people's minds, really, conceptualizing, theorizing how this complexity could work. And, and um, you know, DNA structure got discovered and molecular biology came over. And um, a lot of these sort of complexity-related topics kind of got, um, I guess, um, overshadowed. But I yeah. think now with all these great um, advances in technology that's happening with, you know, sequencing, sequencing is becoming so cheap that you can sequence a whole organism, you know, with a couple of thousand dollars uh, in a day or so. So, and same thing with metabolomics, you know, I told you we can uh, measure thousands of compounds at once. Uh, it takes basically an hour or two uh, this probably will continue to expand exponentially. Um, and so I think it's time for us to go back to yeah. these complexity sort of theories and try to see if we can um, really test some of the hypotheses that were put out so long ago. Yeah, and that is an awesome point. We, we're really good at sequencing DNA, reading DNA. We know exactly what the what the units are, and we're, we're getting better and better at identifying thousands of metabolites and connecting those two is going to be one of the big pushes for the next series of decades. I mean, it, there is so much complexity. There are so many questions there. Uh, and it's surprisingly how hard it is to go from the here in the DNA, except that was the other hand, here in the DNA, to here in the metabolism. That connection it is, I mean, it, thousands of, of science, scientific careers tying those two things together. Um, and it, it, I think it's deceptive. Uh, you know, you, you hear about we're going to sequence this genome, we're going to sequence that genome, we're going to sequence your genome within your lifetime, uh, and that's awesome. But knowing what that means is a much more complicated uh, system than, than we expected. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, you know, I think that with all of these data and trying to really tackle complexity, um, you know, frontally, we need to use computation and programming. And this is really the bulk of the work that we do in our lab. And what's really um, promising, to me at least, uh, about this is that the, the students right now in high school or middle school, they are so, they were born with computers in their, in their little fingers. And so people are so, students are so good at programming yeah. and so comfortable with internet and social media, and which is a type of network. And so I think that, you know, these students will become those that will solve the, the, the mm -hmm. mysteries of this complexity and these, these incredibly complex networks of metabolism or genetic interactions and whatnot. Yeah, I, you're entirely correct. I mean, I, I spent my entire, entire graduate career trying to generate little pieces of DNA sequence. And, you know, we, we can get a thousand times more information now in an afternoon than I got in the four years I was actually doing research as a PhD student. Uh, so the, the kinds of questions are, are changing, but we've got kids that are growing up with that. I mean, this is their norm. Uh, these are the kind of questions that they're used to dealing with. Awesome. Colin, anything else that we should wrap up? How do we? Is there last tie into to classes or, or I, last question? You, know, you, you guys sort of did it. I was sitting here thinking about, and you guys were bringing up some of these really big questions, and I was sitting here thinking exactly about what you guys ended up talking about was that these are really fascinating questions, and for for students who are in school now as they're saying, okay, you know, what's left to discover? Well, you guys have just shown that yeah. there's there's a lot of empty space in our knowledge, uh, you know, between, between like you said, between the genome and, and, and what comes out of it. So, uh, you know what, that's, that's, that's exciting. And it's obvious that, that you guys are excited by the research you're doing and you've painted a nice picture of how it's done. So I think that's, uh, that's really cool and something for kids to think about. That's great. Excellent. Thanks so much. Does anybody have anything else they want to say before we wrap up? I want to thank Sue for coming on. I really appreciate you giving us your, your perspective. It's a neat system that you're working on, a really neat system. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Sue. Yes, so thank you very much, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> so that gets us it for This Week in Science and Education. Until next time. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, Thanks guys. Yeah.